Thank you for that beautiful gift of song. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son onto our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. That's the ending of today's reading. So if you think that's the uh, first time that I've ever worn a tiara, uh, I, I will remind you that I am raising three daughters. Um, I have played many a round of Pretty Pretty Princess, and I have won many a round of Pretty Pretty Princess. So not the first time, and I'm sure it won't be the last. So welcome to our first Sunday sermon after the end of the Advent season. Now, before you jump up, you can make the argument that Advent stretches on to Epiphany Sunday, right? That, that is okay. I won't dispute that if that's how you feel. Um, some people say it end, ended on Christmas Eve. Some people feel that it goes to Epiphany. Either way is fine. But I do think the world moves on quickly from the Christmas season to the next big thing. And the next big thing happens this evening, right? Our next big thing in, in our world is New Year's Eve, the dawn of a new year. And I have to say that I tend to struggle with the change that comes from moving from Christmas on into the new year and then forward. It's not that I struggle with the idea of change or change in general, really. What bothers me is that it feels like we go so quickly from that Christmas season onto another thing. See, I find that this change is very drastic because we go from a season where we are focused on and celebrating the birth of Jesus and all that means to us to a season where we are really focused on ourselves. Now, you, uh, I know what you're thinking, uh, not me, pastor. No, no, not at all. Uh, true, you might not have felt that shift going on in your life, but for a lot of folks, that is what happens. Because when you think about New Year's, what is it that comes to mind? Well, it's probably things like going to a party with friends. Uh, maybe it's the thought that there's no way I'm staying up to watch all the musical acts on Dick Clark's Rockin' New Year's Eve when I have no idea who any of them are. Uh, you know, for a lot of people, what New Year's is, it's a time for resolutions, right? That is what we tend to be focused upon during this time of year. And when you think about it, a resolution is thinking about yourself and the things that you need to change. So we go from a season of being focused on Jesus to a season of being mo more focused on ourselves. And that is why I struggle with the change during this season. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, it's not bad to make resolutions. It's not bad to have a good, honest look at your life and think about the changes that you need to make in order for it to be better. You're right. There is no argument here uh, with that. It is not a bad thing to be self-aware and realizing that you might need to make a change in your life. But I must tell you, I personally, I don't like resolutions. Uh, here on a side note, because as I thought about resolutions throughout the year, so this year I, I turned 40. Um, so let's say I've been making resolutions since I was 10. Um, so that gives me about 30 resolutions, right? Give or take. Um, I'm probably over 30 in keeping resolutions throughout my life as I think about them. Uh, and so that's why I kind of struggle with this idea of making resolutions. But as I thought about how I have failed in so many of them, uh, and also the problem of staying focused on Jesus during this time of year, I came to this conclusion that might help solve both of those problems. 
See, as I thought about all the resolutions that I had made over the years and how I tried to keep and how often I failed at keeping them, I came to a realization. Um, I've always tried to keep my resolutions on my own. I neglected to include the most important thing in my life when setting resolutions and trying to make changes in my life, and that was to include God in that conversation. Now, maybe you've made that mistake as well. If you have, know that I understand. See, when it comes to just about anything involving change in our lives, we want to do it ourselves. We're kind of like little kids in that way, right? Whenever you try to show a little kid how to do something for the first time, what do they almost always say to you? I do it myself, right? I do it myself. Um, and lots of times they don't. Um, but you almost always step back and let them try. <coughs> well, we do that as well. You know, in, in our country, and especially in our working class group of people, we value a can-do spirit. We like people that are willing to put in the work and pull themselves up without help from others. It is much more impressive, at least to me, it is much more impressive to see someone that's had success in their life because of their hard work than it is to see someone uh, that has inherited success from others, right? Um, it's not as impressive if you're born on third base and uh, you get a walk home, right? It's much less impressive than someone who hit a single and then grinded it out for that home for the rest of the bases. So, you know, we are a proud people. We are people that do not like to ask help from others. And while I can't argue that having a good attitude uh, is part of having a strong work ethic, if that's a good attitude to have, it absolutely is. I think sometimes we get so proud that we forget that we need to ask God for help. Now, we're really good at going to God for the big things, right? Really good at going and asking for help in those big times of needs. Lord, help me. I have a medical test this week. Please be with me. You know, we're good at that. We bring those things to him, but for all the small things in life, we tend to want to try and handle it ourselves. But the problem with small things is this, they have a way of becoming big things. See, we need to be making sure we are asking God for his help in all things. And that includes the resolutions that we make. How much more effective could we be if we ask God for his help? How much more successful could we be in meeting our goals if we're willing to follow his plan for us? You see, that is also the problem we face. In order to ask God for help in those small things, we have to humble ourselves before him first. We can't go to God and say, look, I need you to help me do this thing. And I need you to help me do it the way that I want to do it. And I need you to make it turn out the way that I want it to turn out. That is not how God works. And that is not how we should be approaching God. We need to be approaching God and asking him for his help in the way that we prayed earlier this morning. And I'm going to read that to you again, though I know a lot of you probably know it by heart. I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee exalted for thee or brought low for thee let me be full let me be empty let me have all things let me have nothing i freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal and now O glorious god father son and holy spirit thou art mine and i am thine so be it and the covenant which i have made on earth let it be ratified in heaven Amen. Now, I know that most of you realized it earlier when we said it today together as our opening prayer. Um, but just in case you didn't, uh, that is our Wesleyan Covenant prayer, right? Of course, written by our founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley. Um, if you didn't know, that's why you get a lot of these and thous and thots and thines in this, right? Because it's written by him. Those are his words. And what this prayer is to me is exactly what we should be saying to God. 
exactly what we should be saying to him when it comes to our plans and our resolutions for the new year. Put into very simple terms, we are saying, Lord, whatever your will for me, let it be. Let me be open to what it is you have for me. And let me graciously accept whatever it is you have for me in this coming year. Let me put aside my pride and humble myself before you. Now, I'm not sure that there is a better way to set yourself up for success in a new year than doing just that. Humbly accepting whatever it is God has for you in the coming year. Now, it is hard to do at times. It is hard to allow God to change who you are and your life. Because we want to hold on to so many things. We don't want to change because change is often hard and change is often painful. When you think about change in the Bible, what comes to your mind? Well, as I thought about changes in the Bible, the thing that always pops out to me when I think about a great change in the Bible, uh, it is the change that Paul undergoes, right? Maybe the greatest uh, story of a transformation um, other than the actual transfiguration, right? Um, but a very, a very powerful story of change. So Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul when he is visited by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Well, what was he doing on that road to Damascus? Well, he was on that road to go to Damascus with a letter that said that he was to arrest all the Christians that he could find and put them into jail. But Jesus, of course, had other plans for him. And Paul goes on to be one of the great writers and missionaries of our faith. But besides the part where Paul is stricken blind and then healed, let's just put that aside in the story today. Do you think the change that Paul went through was easy? Do you think it was easy for him? Well, if you do, then I have to ask you these questions. How do you think Christians reacted when they met Paul after he first was converted and he told them the story of what happened? Do you think they were opening and welcoming to Paul as he came in? I imagine that the conversations with something like this, uh, yeah, okay, right, Saul, I mean Paul. You, you, sure, you've changed. Oh, hey, my brother that you threw into prison wanted me to tell you hi. Uh, he also said, you can go kick rocks. How do you think the people in Paul's life reacted to hearing of his conversion? What do you mean Saul was converted to Christianity? What do you mean his name is Paul now? You mean Saul, the one who was the golden child, the one who was the upholder of the law? The one who was carrying out God's will and, and, and persecuting those Christians that were changing our faith? That one? That, that's the one who's now become a Christian? Oh, the shame his family must feel. Now, how hard do you think it was for him to come to terms with what he had done to Christians? You see, even when God intervenes in such a strong way in someone's life, it can still be hard to deal with the changes that are happening. Now, I have no doubt that Paul was able to handle all those things because, like John Wesley had pointed out for us today, Paul was firmly rooted and humbly going to the Lord for help after his conversion, of course. See, Paul was the writer that tells us in 1 Thessalonians that we are to pray unceasingly. And I believe he was doing just that at all times, praying unceasingly for God to lead him in the way that God needed to lead him. Now today, if you find yourself struggling in this moment right now to make those changes that you feel are needed, and those changes that you feel God is calling you to make, well, here's the hope that I have for you. And it comes from our scripture for today, where we are told, you see, you are no longer a slave to those things that had you bound in the past. You are now a child of God. And since you are a child of God, you are an heir to his holy kingdom. Well, when you think about that, 
how much greater of a future could you possibly have? My challenge for you this entire year is to pray to the Lord to lead you in the direction he wants you to go and then faithfully and humbly follow him. Amen.